Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHope2018.com. We've been going through the epistle to the Ephesians verse by verse, and in my last video we had looked primarily at the concept of not living as those who are outside of Christ, but rather the giving of thanks. And I spent some time looking at the things for which we are to give thanks, that we belong to God, that we are sons of God, not sons of disobedience, that we are the sheep of his pasture, that he always causes us to triumph, that he's working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, that he always gives us the victory. No wonder we can give thanks. And I pointed out that if we are properly giving thanks, then our minds are where they ought to be. I got an email from a young man whose father is walking out on his mother. He's interested in another woman. And so the two families are breaking apart. And he said, how is that victory? And how is that triumph? And I said, that's why we walk by faith and not by sight. I cannot look at that circumstance and believe that what God has promised, that he always gives us the victory and always causes us to triumph, even in the midst of pain and suffering, in situations that we cannot understand, even in situations that seem to be absolutely impossible to endure, that God didn't mean what he said. God is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, folks, that is a life changer. We looked at the fact that we are not in darkness, but that we are light. And God has called us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. We looked at the concept of, of how that, that is related to the very act of creation itself in Genesis. And that the light of God is basically revealed in the truth of this book, the truth of the Word of God. Essential truth is only revealed in this book, and we cannot separate Christ and His Word. We were, at one time, all of us in darkness. We were not sons of darkness, but we were in darkness, and God called us into His marvelous light. I'm persuaded that those of us who know God and His sovereign power would believe implicitly that if God is about to say, let there be light, there's going to be light. There is no other option. There is going to be light, and God declares that He commanded light to shine in our darkened heart. What's going to happen? It's going to shine. There is no way that God would command light to shine in your heart and it not shine. And yet, the predominant message preached today seems to say that within the human, within the human will, and within the human strength, there's the ability to resist the commandment of the sovereign God. And in just the way that it shined in the book of Genesis, right at the beginning, and that's the illustration that the Holy Spirit uses here. Look, there was darkness upon the face of the deep, and God commanded light to shine, and it shined. And in exactly the same way, there was darkness in the heart, and God commanded light to shine. And it did. It did. And we now have the light of God in the face of Jesus Christ, in the person and the work of our lovely Lord. So we who were sometimes in darkness are now light in the Lord, and we should then walk as what we are. As we finish the eighth verse, we saw that we do not walk in order to become children of light any more than we walk in order to be worthy of the Lord. That's what the exhortation says. We are told that we are children of light, Therefore, we ought to walk as what we are. God has commanded the light to shine. Now let's 
walk like what we really are. A child born to the king and the queen of England is a prince. He's not a prince because of the way he lives or how he plays polo or how he rides a horse. He's a prince because his mother and father are king and queen. And a million times he must hear before he reaches the age of 10, now you're a prince, so act like one. And he probably gets tired of hearing that. The fact is that acting like a prince does not make him a prince. He is a prince and now he ought to live like what he is by birth and that's what God is telling us. God has made us new creations in Christ Jesus and now the exhortation is and we'll see the beautiful climax of this. We'll never get there in this video but we'll see that we'll see that actually hid in the grammar. I shouldn't really say hid, but intrinsic in the grammar is the truth that this is best for us. Walk as what we are for the fruit of this light. Now, if you have the authorized version, it says the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Those are three beautiful words that would describe what God has revealed in his word. That's the result of this walking in the light, the light that we have, which is the word of God, and, and there is no other source of light. We do not have it by special revelation. We don't get it in dreams or in personal experiences any kind of ecstatic utterances, we have it revealed in the Word of God, and the result of that light, His goodness, righteousness, and truth, all of those are attributes of God. It was Pilate who said, what is truth? And many a sermon has been preached on Pilate's searching question. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth. The grand gospel message is called the good news of Jesus Christ, the proclamation of good tidings of Christ, the gospel proclaimed in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see goodness, righteousness, and truth. So in the 10th verse now, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, we arrive at a topic which is very, very difficult for me to put into words. I long for the ability to be a public speaker who could declare in moving terms what I see in my heart and in my mind. The first question that pops into my mind, it may not be the one in yours, but over the years, as I've taught many a Bible class, it seems to me that somehow there is this question there. Why do I care what's acceptable to the Lord? Why do I even care? I'm not under law, but I'm under grace. I mentioned the email that I received from this young brother in Christ about his father leaving his mother. I use Gmail for most of my email correspondence. And to refresh my memory, I read through a previous email that he had sent me last year explaining how he couldn't understand why he could not stop driving 80 miles per hour with a fuzz buster. And I made the comment, is that any worse than what your father is doing? He wrote me back within a, a couple of hours with the reply, well, I guess not. We are the ones who put gradation on sin. We have one sin, which is much worse than another. But my Bible tells me that I should obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And believe me, there are many ordinances of men that I don't particularly enjoy keeping. If you could take for the Lord's sake out of there, 
I'd be much more lawless than I am. But my Bible exhorts me to obey every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Why should I do that? Can I take God at his word that there is no judgment for me because I am in Christ Jesus? That's another life changer. Absolutely. Do I fear the prospect of hell? Absolutely not. That's a real life changer. Do I face the concept of eternal glory and unbroken fellowship with Christ? Absolutely. That's a definite life changer. Life changing truth. Then why should I worry about doing anything that's acceptable to the Lord? And the only rational reason that any Christian mind can reach is love. If you happen to be one of the many people who for some reason or other feel constrained to serve the Lord because if they don't, that they might suffer, then you're under law. To some extent, you are under law. Inasmuch as you have made grace less than grace, You've destroyed it. Grace is then not grace. The only possible reason for having any concern whatsoever for that which is acceptable to God is love. And it seems to me that I can say, and I can say it properly, that if you don't love the Lord enough to do it, then don't do it. Now, this might be pushing the illustration too far, but if you walk by your bank and you know that there are several hundred million dollars in the safe and that you, you now have the opportunity to rob it, but you don't do it because you're afraid of going to jail, that's sin. You might, so That's sin, so you might as well go ahead and rob it. Now, before anybody misunderstands me, I'm not suggesting anybody go out and rob a bank. But I have talked about the moral application and the spiritual application as we've gone through this epistle to the Ephesians. I don't think that you should tell a fib. But I also believe the lie can be seen specifically attached to the context, which is lying against the truth of the Word of God. And what I want to make clear here is the fact that you can sin and feel guilty about it, and you can call that the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when in fact any such, any guilt at all is false guilt and comes from Satan, not from God. And that the old man which we have put off is the source of that sin. And to be disappointed in yourself is to have believed in yourself by which you're saying that your primary focus is on cleaning up the flesh. And I suggest to you that the idea that you are under law, not grace, is just as much a sin. In other words, failure as it regards the moral application is sin. But as it pertains to the spiritual application, confidence in the flesh is just as much a sin as any other. I don't believe you should commit adultery. But spiritual adultery is also a sin in the eyes of God. And I am convinced that when our primary focus is on the spiritual, the practical applications will take care of themselves. If you don't do it because you think that your reputation would be smeared, well, that's sin. I come from a good family. I would never be caught stealing. Well, that's pride. There's only one possible reason I can approach in my own mind for not robbing that bank, and that's because I love the Lord. I have no doubts. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. I have no doubt whatsoever that if I go down here in, t in my town here, and I rob this bank of $100,000, and, 
and I give John Smith and Bob Johnson, you know, that money, we'll, we'll just we'll get a lot of souls saved. And I, that ought to make it worthwhile. That ought to justify it. You know, the end justifies the means, right? I'm willing to go to jail the rest of my life to save souls. So if you're only thinking of the good that may come, I'm certain that if those men are men of character, they would properly use that money in the work of the Lord. But in all due respect to John and Bob, I don't feel very inclined to rob the bank to give them the money. Even if they told me, it, it, if I don't do it, they're going to fail. And a lot of people are going to go to hell. I still wouldn't do it because I love the Lord. And that's the only reason. If that all be true, then it staggers me, staggers my mind, how many things I do do, which I know are not pleasing to the Lord. My love must break down. It's amazing to me how little trouble I have not robbing banks. I just don't feel very inclined to rob banks. If all of you missionaries told me that the whole system is going to collapse and millions of people are going to be deprived from hearing the truth of the Word of God, I still don't feel tempted to rob a bank. So I'm, I'm very strong there when it comes to robbing banks. Very high character there. It seems there are other areas where I don't do so well. I'd like to look at my love of the Savior in the areas where I'm strong, but you see suddenly that that's pride. Why should I be concerned about what's acceptable to the Lord? The word there in the original text means really, that which is really well-pleasing to God. In Romans chapter 8, I am told that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's why I used the illustration uh, just a moment ago, that if you don't rob the bank because your family's reputation would be smeared, that's sin, that's pride. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. It cannot be pleasing to God that I don't rob the bank to preserve my family's reputation. I believe God is dealing in your life to lead you to increased love of the Savior, not increased fear of the Savior. Because perfect love casts out fear. I think that's a verse that most Christians are, are aware of. It was the elders of the church who came and uttered foolishness over Job's head, theological foolishness that, that, that did not lead Job to rejoice in the glory and the power and the majesty of God, but rather to look at the failure of his flesh. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. So the first thing I know is that in any exercise of my flesh, there is no possibility of being acceptable unto God. Proving what is acceptable un, unto, unto God. It has to be in the Word of God and in the Spirit of God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. The word cannot is a very strong word. Yea, they do not have the power to do so. Yet somehow or other, the predominant missionary message that I hear is a message apparently addressed to flesh. To get that flesh to do something to please God in order that it might become spirit. And I find that to be contrary to the message of the Word of God. The only possibility of pleasing God is a new creation. For neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. And I didn't make the new creation. God did. So if I'm going to start with any acceptability and any well-pleasing to God, it must be in the sphere of the Spirit. That puts it in the sphere of the Word of God. Secondly, if I go on in Romans 12, I see that I am exhorted by God to present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable 
unto God, which is a spiritual service. It's not a carnal service. Somehow or other, we take the text and we try to point out that this is a spiritual responsibility to put my carnal nature or carnal creation in, in such a, a manner that it's acceptable to God, and it never will be. Never was my old man acceptable to God. It cannot be acceptable to God. It will not be acceptable to God in any effort I spend to make or try to make the old creation acceptable to God is wasted effort and a lack of understanding of the truth of the Word of God. We, uh, we noted as we approached the fifth chapter that there is a key passage of Scripture and much of Christianity can, can be divided into two major camps as to how you take that passage. What does the Word teach me about the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ? It teaches me that the old man has been put off, that the new man has been put on, and that God is renewing me in the spirit of my mind. However, by far and away, the majority of those who proclaim the Word of God declare in Ephesians 4 that what that passage really says is you ought to put off the old man, that you ought to be renewed, in the spirit of your mind, and that you ought to put off or, or put on the new man so that your activity becomes primarily centered in those three areas. Now, that makes a tremendous difference. If you're spending all of your time in an area that God's already finished with, then you're, you're sort of lagging behind. It's a... Poor illustration, particularly for those of you who are not computer oriented, but computer illustrations ought to be good today because this is a computerized world we live in. It, it would be as though I came to one of you experts, one of you experts in the field of, of, of internet technology or computer technology, and I said, now look, you have got to look at this new product I came up with. I've got this new computer. It has 59,000 of these vacuum tubes in it with a large power supply to heat them and or cool them or whatever the case might be. And this computer fills a room about oh so big. And man, you'd be amazed. I have four kilobytes of memory in this thing. And you'd say, Steve, that won't sell. I, I have here in my pocket a new Apple smartphone that has 128 gigabytes of internal storage. I think I'd be told that I'm lagging behind the times. I find many Christians involved in areas where God's already finished. If God declares that by virtue of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ that the old man has been put off, then you're, spent, you're spending any time putting the old man off is spinning your wheels. Ephesians 4 is a crucial passage of Scripture. Because I find most of my Christian friends and most of those who come to Bible classes I teach, one place or another, absolutely convinced that in Ephesians 4, they're told to do this. Whereas I am absolutely convinced that Ephesians 4 says, God did this. And boy, does that make a difference. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have, ye have put off the old man with his deeds and and ye have, that's past tense, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. You're either going to occupy yourself diligently with trying to do something that, that it's already done. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Well, we know that we commit sin. Therefore, that passage in 1 John must be saying that, that who, whoever, whosoever is born of God does not habitually practice sin. Until you realize that what God is talking about there is the old man, the flesh, in which there dwells no good thing. The reason we have a sinless new nature is because the old man isn't going to heaven. If it were, heaven would be a horrifying place to be. 
one of the grandest concepts to me of glory outside of, of being in personal fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It may not be a concept that's precious to you, but it is to me. One of the grandest concepts of glory is that for the first time, I can go without sinning. Just imagine, for, for eternity, for timelessness, I will never again sin against my Savior. I want a fellowship with Christ. I want to see my Savior face to face. Outside of those concepts, the grandest concept to me that just staggers my imagination is that, that for timelessness, I will never again sin against Christ. When someone tells me, whoever is born of God does not habitually practice sin, but he can occasionally, it devastates me. It actually ruins my concept, my entire concept of glory. But the passage goes on and says, His seed abides in him and he doesn't have any ability to sin. If my new nature has no ability to sin, I suddenly realize why heaven will not be tarnished by another Adam's fall. And that I can, in fact, rest and, and I can rejoice in the concept that I will always please my Lord. Now I'm exhorted that in the Word of God, I know what pleases God. It's the light that proves what is acceptable unto the Lord. And so when I go to the Word of God, I know what pleases God. I know what pleases Him. If you open up your that book that you're holding there in your hands. Open up that Bible of yours and you're looking at what pleases God. And I'm exhorted to present my body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Many a Christian today often throws that word grace around as if to somehow suggest that, that grace is merely some principle that comes into play when I need it. And as long as I'm performing well on my own, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. And I don't necessarily need it. We stand and we sing Amazing Grace only to sit under some lengthy sermon on how that we are under law, not grace. I've studied this book enough to realize to my utter and complete amazement that if one could sum up the entire Word of God in one concise statement, which is not something I could put into human words, it would clearly reveal two primary things, man's abject failure and that in contrast to the person and the work of Christ on behalf of those who belong to Him. That grace is so vastly far-reaching in its nature and its function that it covers every breath that we take and every step that we take as we travel through this world in this body of sin. That every possible, to use a Navy term, every possible hatch has been sealed to make our lives in Christ so secure and so watertight, impervious to sinking down into the depths of sin from which we've been delivered because of, of who built the ship and who is at its helm, that every foreseen hindrance has been accounted for, that every obstacle has been overcome, and we are neither the shipbuilders nor are we the captains of our salvation. No wonder the text says we are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of the darkness, but rather reprove them. It is this book that does that. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Now there is an aspect of me as there is an aspect of you that lusts after those unfruitful works of darkness, that rebels against God. I am persuaded that many of the things I did as a child I wouldn't have done if my parents hadn't told me not to do them. The very fact that I was told not to do them raised, raised, seemed to raise some kind of an unknown flag in my construction 
that said, I'm going to try that. And there is something in my construction today that lusts after those unfruitful works of darkness. Now I'm speaking on the in the more as far as the moral application is concerned here, not the spiritual application, the moral application. The only opportunity I have in knowing what is intelligent and what is correct is the Word of God, not my feelings. I have a makeup that God has annulled in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but not annihilated. It isn't disintegrated. And the only answer I have to that is the Word of God, not my logical reasoning process, not rationalization that I am so, seem to be so capable of doing but the light of the Word of God. It's the light of the Word of God that proves what is acceptable to God and what is an unfruitful work of darkness. That's how I can separate them. I have the Word of God that says the works of the flesh are manifest, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, idolatry, witchcraft, and so on and so forth. I have the Word of God that says the fruit of the light and the fruit of the Spirit is goodness, righteousness, and truth. So I have light of God that says that the desires of the one is the old man, and I have the truth of the Word of God that the new man has been put on, and I'm not going to annihilate that. I am heaven-bound regardless. I might be a murderer like David whom God said was a man after his own heart. I might be a murderer like Moses, but I am heaven bound. That is grace. I don't want to go through the suffering to which David passed, but I'm persuaded that in that circumstance, David learned to, to, to love the Lord and to trust the Lord. He put on sackcloth and ashes and, and God said, fear not David, I have put away thy sin. If that didn't lead David to love rather than fear, I don't know what would have. I see David in fear and then I see him in love because of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why should I be enjoying participation in that which is not pleasing to my God? If... The light of the Word of God showing you what is well-pleasing to God is not sufficient for you. If that doesn't say to you that I shouldn't be a partner with the unfruitful works of darkness because it doesn't please my loving Lord, if that is not sufficient, law won't do it. Verily, if there had been a law given which could have given life, righteousness would have come by the law. But God has concluded all under sin that the righteousness by the faith of Jesus Christ might be revealed to all. I praise God that he has revealed what is pleasing to him. And because I love him, I want to please him. And so we read in 1 Peter that we are being built up a lively priesthood, lively stones into a holy priesthood in order that we may offer sacrifices acceptable unto God. Most of the sacrifices in the Old Covenant were worship. We don't offer a redemptive sacrifice. We offer sacrifices of worship. That's why God's building us up. And the structure of that body, the cement of that body, is love. The darkness that overshadowed the earth, the darkness that it was upon the face of the deep was, I believe, was that which was contrary to the light of the Word of God. So theologically speaking, theology, I'm not talking about morally here now, theologically speaking, the unfruitful works of darkness are primarily twisting the truth of the Word of God which I believe then leads to those carnal acts of the flesh, the moral application of the verses that we've been looking at. 
Verse 11, have no joint partnership, no participation, no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now those are all articulated. Have, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of the darkness, but rather reprove them. It seems as though the Holy Spirit is carefully pointing out to us that we are not here allowed the license to decide what these are. Unfruitful works of darkness is pornography. Unfruitful works of darkness is adultery or, or, or robbery or murder or whatever, so on and so forth. In Colossians, we read, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is at the right hand of God. Well, if, if I had written that, there would have at least been a footnote there. See, see Appendix A, and there would have been 10, 20, 30, 50, I don't know how many pages, defining, def, just going down the list, defining uh, for you the things which are above. Streets of gold, golf courses with no sand traps, and, you know, just let my mind wander as, as to what things above might be. And then I recognize that a study of the Word of God is a study of truth. Now I've come to the conclusion that God does not allow me to write, to interject my own meanings into these passages of Scripture. I can't read into it. That's eisegesis. I can't read into it what I think it, it means, what it, what it says. Many times I hear Bible students say, well, the reason these things are undefined is so that we can fit them for our own particular need. And I don't, I've come to the conclusion that that can lead me into some very dangerous waters. It might be more logical to suggest that the reason that they are not defined is that we ought to know them. And now when the Holy Spirit speaks of things above, he, expects, he, he really expects us to know what he means. The finished work of Christ. He used definite articles. I, I speak of him as the Holy Spirit, not the Apostle Paul. So the, that we might not just pour into that 11th verse all of the things which we think are wrong. And, of course, we, we naturally we have to skirt all those things that we do. Which we have rationalized to be correct. I believe the unfruitful works of the darkness or the unfruitful works of the darkness are clearly manifested in the Word of God as those works which are accompanied with a darkness that we saw in the opening scenes of this book which follow through to its end. It is a kingdom ruled over by Satan. It is a process of discrediting the truth of God by messengers of light when they are really proclaiming darkness. I want to be careful and say that I'm not suggesting that immorality is not involved in this verse, that there's not a, a practical application, a moral application. I wouldn't in any way suggest to you that there are not several applications of passages of Scripture, but I do not believe that the moral application is the primary sense of the verse that we're looking at here, but rather a spiritual application of spiritual wicked, wickedness in high places. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers of the darkness of this age. So I believe the Holy Spirit expects us to understand here that this is a spiritual warfare engaged between the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. One that's ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ and the other ruled over by the prince of this age. He who once was light now rules a kingdom of darkness. That's the darkness penetrated by the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Well, does it, what, is, what, what does that mean? What, the, so they love robbing banks and they love raping women and they love pornography and they might just go on down the list. I'm not disputing that. I'm not saying that they don't. Light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. They, yes, they yes they love those things, but I do not think that's what that's talking about. Primarily, 
what I primarily think that's talking about when it says light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light is just what I, I previously said. It is not, not as much a moral application as it is a spiritual one and what they truly love. Listen to me, folks. What they truly oppose is the finished work of Christ and they opt instead in its place. They would rather actually focus on this on self, the flesh, the law, themselves, rather than the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, we could say that the darkness that they love was their morality, and I believe that's true, but only partially true. For I believe much more significant is the fact that man loves his spiritual darkness he loves it look what the text says it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret in 10,000 I don't know at least sermons have been preached on the horrors of pornography of child exploitation and, and a thousand and one other things and all of them bad no question about it in my mind it's all bad. There's no doubt, but that spiritual darkness leads to moral darkness, just as spiritual light leads to moral light. So yeah, it's a shame to speak of the immorality that takes place in that darkness, but your definition of darkness might be different than, than my definition of darkness or another person's definition of darkness, and so I'm forced to conclude that God has something particular in mind here in the text right here, just as we have seen in the passages that preceded it. It is articulated, the darkness. It was the Holy Spirit who led the prophets of the Old Testament into the experience, the knowledge, the, the revelation of the spiritual wickedness that went on in Israel. It was the idolatry, it was the secret worship of Baal, that God exposed primarily to the prophets. Zephaniah says, Every man was worshiping idols and hit in his secret house. It's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. I believe that spiritual fornication is infinitely more horrible in the eyes of God than moral fornication. But, in verse 13 is an, is an interesting verse. But the all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. First of all, I believe the all things, the reason it's articulated is because these are the things covered in the Word of God and nothing more needs to be covered. I, I really get in trouble here with this. I, I'm going to do this anyway. I want to say it anyway. I am totally dedicated to the fact that Almighty God in this book gave us all of the revelation that He intended to give us. No more dreams, no more visions, no more gifted people who add to the body of truth that is not yet complete. There. Uh, that ought to cause about half of you to uns unsubscribe. But as a side note, I was, I'm going to tell you folks, I don't care. I don't care. I get down to five subscribers, I'll keep doing this. I get down to three subscribers, I'll probably keep doing this. I get down to one, I think I'll just forget about all this and just call him up on the telephone. Look, folks. And when the Holy Spirit speaks of the all things, he's speaking of that which is covered, that which is dealt with in the Word of God. And no more needs to be considered. It's when we begin to add to the message of this book or subtract from it that we come under the curse of Almighty God. The all things that are reproved, all of the things in this book on which God has shed light are made manifest by that light. They are openly apparent by the light of the Word of God for whatsoever is made apparent is light. Well, that's a problem for the translator. For the 
because the authorized version says, whatsoever is made or doth make manifest is light, suggesting that the means by which the uh, apparentness or the manifestation is made is the light, but that which is manifested is not light. Now, there's a problem there. If we was in a room that was, it was pitch dark, just total, complete blackout, and all kinds of evil was going on, and somebody turned on a big spotlight, it'd be difficult to say that darkness is, is right there because the light's shining on it. Pretty hard. Pretty hard to have darkness when light is there. I suppose somebody could, could say, well, there are dark corners in that room, but nothing's very dark because the light's on. And as long as the light is on, it won't be dark. And I believe the text is saying not that the spiritual immorality and the physical immorality is light but there that but that there isn't darkness there when the light shines so it's made manifest as to what it really is what I'm suggesting is that when the light shines that which is wrong even physically wrong is made apparent it's in the light now not that evil, spiritually or physically, is actually light, but it's made apparent. It's not darkness anymore. It's like, we know what it is. It's clearly revealed. And this requires the light of the Word of God. I am taking the position that this light is not some knowledge you may have, some brilliant inspiration that may have come to you, in the middle of the night, but that it is, in fact, Almighty God, inseparable from His Word, and that the light that we're speaking of here is the light that is, that is God, and that is His Word. For God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all, and I believe the Word of God thereby is also light, light that He has given us, which, which is His Word, this, this book. And we have the opportunity of holding it forth. It's the only light that the world system has. And I speak of the world system primarily as a theological or an ecclesiastical system. It's only light is this book and you it's only light holder and so we'll stop here until next time I love you all I truly do if you are finding these videos to be encouraging or helpful in any way I'd love to hear from you you can email me from our website at blessedhope2018.com or heavenlysign2017.com thank you for all of your prayers your messages of encouragement and support. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for listening.